TensorFlow and Scikit, they're both machine learning frameworks and comparing the two, we're gonna see some significant differences in the ability to leverage one of these frameworks over the other. Now let's take a quick look at TensorFlow. The whole idea of TensorFlow is deep learning and big data where you can have terabytes and terabytes worth of data that can be distributed across a lot of different GPU servers. It's accelerated framework and also has easy access with uh, higher level language framework techniques with Python and Keras, which makes it a little bit easier for you to specifically design your own machine learning model that can be leveraged for deep learning. Now you're gonna build things. You can go all, you can build ChatGPT with TensorFlow. You're not gonna do that with Scikit. So let's take a look here at the different use cases and purposes with TensorFlow. It's a deep learning framework that's gonna be used, you know, for machine learning and we're kind of in the AI realm. With TensorFlow, you can build big data applications that leverage your own custom model and you can do deep learning through multi-perceptron, uh, this is the MLP style of multi-perceptron of deep learning where it is fully connected feed forward neural networks. All the most advanced models use this approach, just a quick call out to PyTorch. PyTorch, of course, comes to us open source from Meta and is a sort of a lower level framework, though it is used by all the bigger companies, right? Like OpenAI will be using PyTorch and they use that for a more accelerated features and capabilities. Now, TensorFlow has come up in its capabilities to take pace with some more advanced uh, performance capabilities as well. Um, though if we continue down here, essentially we're comparing deep learning uh, neural networks compared to Scikit where we're gonna have more of a spreadsheet style, right? Where Scikit, um, let's see here. Yeah, we're within Scikit, we're kind of gonna do some data science essentially with Scikit. And we're gonna see things like spreadsheet size levels of data, multiple spreadsheets, you can databases, but not large volumes of data, like uh, an entire library of books, for example, or an entire repository of images. So with scikit-learn, you're gonna mostly do classification, regression, clustering. You're gonna do some data science-y things on top of spreadsheets. It's a perfect use case. There is no GPU acceleration in scikit. It's not built for large language and you cannot do deep learning with scikit. Scikit is going to be a little bit easier to get into if you're looking to start with machine learning. Scikit has a, a really great starting point. So the complexity comparatively you, you have TensorFlow more complex because it's way more flexible, right? And you can do your own custom deep learning models. Obviously you can copy and paste a few of the pre-existing ones. So it's still pretty easy from that perspective. Uh, and it, you're gonna have a lot of flexibility in your ability to create any kind of AI. With TensorFlow Scikit, much simpler, pre-built models specifically for utilities and machine learning tasks that allow you to identify which features of the input on the data is going to be uh, correlating, so correlation coefficients to outputs uh, for you to do regressions, right? And these are not gonna be deep learned regressions. They're standard matrix regressions. So you lose some flexibility there, uh, though it is really fast. It's gonna be a lot faster than TensorFlow uh, and or PyTorch comparatively because you're dealing with a smaller amount of data and it's gonna be leveraging just your CPU and these models uh, can work a lot faster in scikit-learn. So this might be a good place for you to start. If you've been thinking about machine learning, start with scikit-learn. We're comparing TensorFlow with scikit-learn and if you look at the performance differences, TensorFlow has the ability to leverage GPU compute compared to scikit-learn. It can't do that. It's only gonna give you CPU hardware access. So with the idea with TensorFlow, it's specifically targeted for GPU acceleration. And we're looking at the ability for it to scale for a large amount of data. And you can distribute the workload across a lot of different machines. Now Scikit is gonna be primarily CPU oriented and it's specifically built for smaller data sets, right? Your spreadsheet sized data sets. And it's gonna be very, very fast comparatively because it doesn't have the overhead of all that distributed nature. And it's also a single layer. You can't get multiple layers for deep learning uh, because you won't need it anyway. So it's gonna be less scalable in terms of the amount of data. You're usually gonna use it for a smaller scale. Problem.
project. Now, both of these frameworks uh, have pretty good ecosystems and community support. They're both widely used. There's a lot of, uh, because deep learning requires a lot of data and it's difficult to analyze how that data is performing in your model, you get additional tools like TensorBoard and uh, TensorFlow Serving, which allows you to serve the model because the models are so big, you're gonna need a way to operate, uh, you have to operate the model in production on a server. Uh, and so you'll you'll see a large community and it all of this comes from Google. TensorFlow is from Google. And you compare that with PyTorch, for example, which comes from Meta, the owner of Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp. Scikit-learn here is a strong ecosystem with integrated scientific libraries such as NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib, which is gonna be a graphing system. So you're gonna typically use Scikit-learn a lot more, uh, maybe even on your just local machine. You won't need to do deep learning or a large amount of training because it can perform so fast. It's specifically targeted for spreadsheet size data, right? So you're gonna see an active community that's uh, it's mostly gonna be used for classical machine learning tasks and uh, a smaller set of data where you kind of already have an identified set of features and labels. And of course, if you didn't have the features and labels, those, those are machine learning terms. Features are simply just what you input into the model, the input data, that's the features, right? So how many, how much, let's say if it's a company and the feature of a company could be the number of employees, how long the company has been around, the name of the company, the location of the company, what country is it in, uh, how, uh, what's the revenue of the company, um, what is the industry of the company, right? Those are features, right? Features uh, and then labels, are the output. So you might want to see uh, the output you can predict based on all those input features. It's going to be the output that's going to be called the labels. I'm trying to think of a good example for a label in this scenario. You might say uh, stock price. That's a good one. You can use its uh, stock price. It, what is the stock going to increase or decrease based on its past performance, which is input features and the name of the company's industry, all these input features and the output label, which could be an indication of whether the stock's gonna increase in price or decrease in price. That would be the output or the labels. We're gonna look at some example use cases for TensorFlow and Scikit-learn. For TensorFlow, you're gonna be able to do things that require large amounts of data, such as image data where you have a lot of pixels and you can do image classification like determining object detection in an image which you can also do the same with videos so you can take snapshots of videos in a frame and you can use that to uh, can use a CNN convolutional neural network to extract all the features automatically for you using filter maps and you can detect whether there's a, like a dog or a car or you know a person in the photograph, uh, for example, that would be a good use for TensorFlow. You also have natural language processing, so we can see, uh, give it a whole bunch of text, right? Organic text, maybe a chat session with a support agent. You'll be able to take that text, run uh, a, a model on with Keras and TensorFlow to build a model that will give you, say, for example, its output's going to be how neutral or negative or positive that sentiment is uh, in that sentence that's been provided to the model. That's a good one for TensorFlow. And of course, generative models, right? The transformers, ChatGPT, that's a generative pre-trained transformer. You can do this as well with TensorFlow. And the good news is they already have everything that you need, a, a tokenizer and a whole bunch of other things that you need in order to get the model to work properly. Uh, Multi-head attention and uh, feed forward neural networks. So we're looking at the GPT workflow here. Data acquisition, we load the data, read the text, tokenize it, process, process it, add padding if needed, just to make sure that everything's uniform. Um, then you embed the data, you transform it, uh, and make sure it feeds forward through the neural network. Uh, you Compiling and fitting the model is essentially the training process, right? Uh, and then the output will be the text generation. For scikit-learn, you're gonna, you could do things like classification and logistics regression. So you'll be able to sort of do predictive uh, outputs, right? So based on a series, what is gonna be the next uh, number in that series? You can do things like that classification uh, based on a, a set of database fields. What does this, uh, this, this entry in the database, 
most closely resemble. And you can either do, uh, uh, you can know what those each classifications are, like industry, for example, what kind of company that industry is in. Uh, you'll be able to, uh, what is that called? Um, supervised learning, that's right. So supervised learning is where you know what the inputs and outputs are, uh, or you could do an unsupervised learning where you just feed the model a whole bunch of uh, input data parameters, uh, and then you have uh, a set of outputs like one through 10, and then you can sort of cluster the models around that and sort of get an idea. So you use uh, k-means clustering here as well with scikit-learn. And the cool part is with scikit-learn, you don't have to do most, you don't have to do hyperparameter tuning uh, with scikit-learn. It is a lot simpler uh, and more streamlined. It's also gonna be a lot faster. So if you're doing uh, like uh, database, like CRM database analysis, and you want to use machine learning technologies, use scikit-learn for that.